Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome Bishop Paprocki, clergy, families, board members, founders, board members, friends, teachers, and principals. It's truly a great day at McGinty. There's an excitement in the air, and it's all about each of you. The entire McGivney family is very proud of you, and we want to celebrate this accomplishment. It's also my privilege to introduce Danielle Gilhard, who will start the ceremony with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today with thankful hearts for the graduating class of 2016. We thank you for giving each of us the talents, abilities, and self-discipline required for this wonderful accomplishment. We are grateful to you for providing the teachers, mentors, coaches, and administrators who have taught us, nurtured us, and challenged us along the way. Now that our minds have been well equipped with the basic knowledge of many different subjects, we pray that we will excel in our future endeavors. Add wisdom and discernment to our knowledge. Infuse our ambitions and dreams with your love. Help us to desire your plan for our future. Remind us that you are only a prayer away when we meet obstacles, heartbreaks, and challenges. May we always be courageous enough to ask for help, advice, and support when we need it. May we never suffer alone without reaching out to you and to others who care. As we become independent adults, help us learn the secret of dependence on you. Give us a desire to know more about you. May we find you in scripture, in the gathering of your people, and in the beauty of your creation. May your blessings be upon us as we set forth on our own paths, full of joy and promise. Father Michael McGivney. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I would like to introduce Joseph Richard, who will lead the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Today we celebrated the first baccalaureate mass in the House Chapel. We had our first graduation brunch, which followed in the Griffin Nest. Uh, this is the first time that McGivney's students put on caps and gowns. Some people had to show them how to wear them. Uh, this is the first time that pomp and circumstance was played. And of course, this is the first time that graduates of Father McGivney High School will come across this stage and graduate. But before then, there are a few other firsts. Well, this afternoon, I am honored to present the first Father Michael J. McGivney Legacy Award, which is the highest award presented to two graduating seniors, a male and a female. The recipients of this award have been nominated by our faculty. Uh, they exemplify the spirit of our Catholic high school and our patron, Father Michael J. McGivney. Both recipients have exhibited the foundation, foundational pillars of unity, charity, fraternity, and patriotism. They possess an excellent attitude and a proficiency in academics, demonstrated a Christ-centered and active faith life, devoted to serving the culture of life and joyfully living out their faith through prayer and the celebration of the sacraments while courageously sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus. On behalf of Father McGivney faculty and administration, it gives me great pleasure to present the first ever Father Michael J. McGivney Legacy Award uh, to the following graduates. There's only been one person that's seen the results of this, and he's standing right behind me, Mr. Scholes. He didn't even trust me with this. So I would like to say congratulations uh, to the following students. Start with the ladies first. Daniel Gilhart.
and Mr. Joey Richard. It gives me great pleasure today to announce those students graduating with academic honors. The honors cum laude, magna cum laude, and summa cum laude represent the hard work and determination these students have exhibited throughout their years at McGivney. The cum laude distinction honors those graduates with a cumulative grade point average 3.5 to 3.6, magna cum laude, honors those with a cumulative grade point average of 3.7 to 3.8, and summa cum laude honors those with a cumulative grade point average of 3.9 to 4.0. Students, when your name is called, please proceed to the stage to receive your medal. Parents, siblings, and grandparents, when the student's name is called, Please rise to be honored for the support you have given the student throughout these past four years. Please hold your applause until all honor students have received their medals. Andrew Michael Taphorn, cum laude, son of Michael and Beverly Taphorn, grandson of Donald and Shirley Taphorn, and Norman and Mary Collins. Morgan Elizabeth Wagner, cum laude, daughter of Brandon and Kelly Wagner, granddaughter of Harry and Beverly Wagner, Randy Bond, and Todd and Beverly Molman. Brian Thomas Domerick, magna cum laude, son of Tom and Michelle Domerick, grandson of Jim and Lorraine Domerick, Helen DeBorge, and the late Benny DeBorge. Joseph Anthony Richard, magna cum laude, son of Steve and Ann Richard, grandson of Adriana Ludgate, the late Frederick Richard, and the late Alice and Virgil Tipton. Madeline Margaret Teal, magna cum laude, daughter of Judy Teal and Scott Teal, granddaughter of Eunice Teal and the late Jean Teal, Thomas and Margaret Madura. Danielle Rose Vilhard, magna cum laude, daughter of Doug and Diane Vilhard, granddaughter of Paul and Karen Vilhard, and Tony and Sue Serta. <laughs> Nina Isabel Rodriguez, summa cum laude, daughter of Sally Rodriguez and Lazaro Rodriguez granddaughter of the late Jane Gonzalez. Can you reach it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in congratulating the Father McGivney Honors graduates. Good afternoon. I would like to start off by thanking Bishop Brocky and Father Jeff. Because of your support and that of the diocese, we are here as proud members of the first graduating class of Father McGinney Catholic High School. I would also like to thank Mr. and Mrs. Billhart, and not just for putting up with me in freshman carpool. Without the two of you, I know I would not be standing here today. Not just in this room, but I mean without the McGivney you first envisioned and fought for, I would not be standing in this place in my, particular, in my life. With so many accomplishments behind me and so many opportunities ahead of me, your dedication and tenacity have taught me lessons that served me well over the last four years, and I am confident that they will continue to do so in the future. To Ms. Majura and Ms. Jolenbeck, the two of you are like at-school mothers to us. You were the people we turned to when we would break our laptop, we would need consulting, 
forget key uniform items, we would slam our face in the door jam and result in a medical emergency, or we would, write, or we would tear our pants three times. Uh, well, most of those were me. Uh, I'm sure you did the same, you would do the same for anyone else, and we are all very grateful. Speaking of forgetting, forgetting key uniform pieces, Mr. Scholes, I've literally walked a day in your shoes, and I know that there's nothing you wouldn't do for any one of us. Your unique brand of tough love have prepared us all for the future ahead. After years of hearing, you're going to get your hair cut this weekend? I'm not quite sure if I'm going to be able to figure that out independently. <laughs> to the rest of the faculty and staff, you've been our daily encouragement to be our very best, not just as students, but as people as well. You've pushed us, even when we really didn't want to be pushed. You've helped us back on our feet when we felt like slipping. You've been a comforting reassurance when we felt like breaking down, and a stern encourager when you knew we weren't giving our all. And you've taught us that as long as we try, we haven't failed. And I'm not just talking about finals week. But mostly, I would like to thank my fellow members of the class of 2016. You've been my family, my sisters and brothers throughout these last four years. A perfect example of this happened just a few weeks ago when I roomed with Abram and Hunter at the senior retreat. We started off the night with Hunter teaching Abram and I a dance made popular by Miley Cyrus. Because parents and a bishop are here, I'm gonna call that square dancing. <laughs> but that's besides the point, because after about an hour, Abram and I discovered we can't square dance as well as Hunter can. <laughs> Afterwards, we stayed up until three in the morning just talking about our lives. We talked about our memories at school. We talked about college and what we wanted to do with our lives. We talked about our families and relationships. I can't tell you how many times we were about to go to sleep and then someone said, have you ever thought about, and then we would talk about that subject and everything related to it. Uh, and I realized in reflection that I would have had the similar conversation with every single one of you, besides the dancing. The reason being that you were all really like family to me. And I feel like even though we've had our fair share of ups and downs, we all love each other. And I feel like we all have that. Not only do I really care about you, but you all have to realize you've taught me something excellent. Paige, freshman year when you converted Catholicism, it made me take a deeper look at my faith. And I realized that the faith that I had taken for granted for years had so much more uh, to appreciate about it. Logan, you've always spoken your mind, no matter what the circumstances. You're the most honest person in our class, and I feel like oftentimes you're saying what we're all thinking, but don't really have the courage to say. You've taught me to have courage in my thoughts and words. Nick, at the beginning of sophomore year, you could say I'm a bit uptight. From the first day you walked in the doors of McGivney, you've been an example of calm, cool, and relaxed. <laughs> Throughout the years of McGivney, you've taught me to stop worrying about small things and to just enjoy life. Madeline, when I'd be doing an assignment last minute, I knew if I asked you when it was before 8 o'clock, you'd always be able to help me with it because you've done it three weeks ago. <laughs> you've taught me to be more diligent in my studying, even though most everyone in this room knows I'll still get the assignment done 30 minutes before it's due. Hunter, we've already gone over what you've taught me recently. Uh, but I remember a time back in grade school and middle school when you were shy and kept to yourself. Now look at you. You're the person I can count on to talk to, and mainly you've taught me that people grow and change. Abram, Throughout the year, uh, freshman year, I thought I was the butt of your jokes a lot of the time. Uh, throughout the years, I realized that that's just your humor, and you only really talk that way with people that you are comfortable with and consider friends. While well, freshman year, I would have said we weren't that close. Now I consider you to be my, one of my best friends. You've taught me to be less sensitive and to laugh at myself. Nina? You've been our class's model for excellent, for academic excellence. You've taught me to always keep trying in school because in your four years here, I can't think of many times you haven't. Griffin, when you transferred here halfway through sophomore year, you wasted absolutely no time asserting yourself into our family. After about a month of being with us, I don't think anyone would have guessed you actually transferred here. You've taught me that if you want to make friends in life, you gotta put yourself out there. Andy, I've been in every single class with you since freshman year, excluding house. 
Uh, and one of the biggest things I've noticed is, especially in our math classes, you're always searching for a new and improved way of doing things. You've taught me to seek alternative routes when the normal one seems far too complicated. Danielle, you're probably the most orderly person in our class. Your handwriting looks like word font. <laughs> You've taught me the importance of being neat in what I do. Honestly, however, I'm still realizing this lesson because you should all see my room right now. Morgan, this year in house, uh, you were my greatest competitor. Since placement came out halfway through the year, I've made a goal in my house to always one-up your house so we could get ahead. While I'm still trying to figure out how you cheated, <laughs> it's pretty obvious that your leadership had a great effect on your house's performance. You've taught me the importance of friendly, respectful competition. Hannah Winston, I think it's safe to say that we didn't really get along early on in high school. But I feel like that's uh, changed in the past few months. You've taught me that in a family, forgiveness is always possible. Hannah Starnes, Erica, and Alana. You all came here when we were upperclassmen. Our family, we felt, was already complete, but we were so wrong. Before too long, there was no distinguishing you from the rest of us because you came and you just fit in perfectly. You've taught me that the familial love and care has no limits, and that those who come last are not loved any less. Joey? <laughs> I've known you since you moved into my neighborhood. When I decided to go to McGivney, you were my first friend, uh, and the one who helped me to love McGivney from the beginning. I think the greatest lesson you've taught me is that it's always nice to have someone you know when you're going to a completely new environment. That's why I'm extremely excited to be going to college with you, Madeline, and Nina. Because although you three are probably going to be hanging out with the engineering and business nerds, and I'll be hanging out with those really cool pre-med students, I know that I'll have friends to look to, and I'll have someone right off the bat. Finally, I'd like to thank the parents of the students. Because without you, none of them would be the way they are today. And the way they are is just perfect. Looking at all of us, I think it's safe to say we have, uh, that we have many more adventures and accomplishments to come. But I know, at least for me, none of them will be more educational or make me more proud than being a part of the pioneer class of Father McGinley Catholic High School. Thank you all. Seniors, we have arrived. Today is May 22nd, 2016, and we are here on graduation day. This is our final high school milestone, but a bunch of new ones are about to begin. Four years ago, we couldn't have dreamed of this moment, but we've made it. I know my McGivney family understands when I say that this moment is truly bittersweet. I speak for all of my classmates when I say that we are grateful for all that has been done for us. We would not be here without the founding board, who put their hearts and souls into this project. We would not be here in this gym without the support of all who donated to the capital campaign. We would not be here without our parents, who chose to send us to this school. We would not be here without the help of our wonderful teachers, who pushed us to pursue excellence. We would not be here without a principal, Mike Schultz, who encouraged us to be leaders. But most importantly, we would not be here without the help of our Heavenly Father, who made all of this possible. While I was digging through the internet, trying to find ideas for this speech, I read that it was cliche to talk about milestones. But the more I thought about it, I realized the whole McGivney experience is about those milestones, in new beginnings. My class is like the firstborn child, we were doted on. Pictures were taken constantly. We were always speaking at events to promote our school. People from different newspapers interviewed us and wanted to know what it meant to be a McGivney Griffin. Every milestone was captured and every achievement was recognized. I know, it sounds like a lot of hard work, but don't let us fool you because we were spoiled the whole time. The first of those milestones was the inaugural mass. It was the very beginning of freshman year, and thinking back to when I met my class for the first time, the word that pops into my head is awkward. We just stared at each other around the dinner table and tried to make small talk. I was so shy I didn't even mention that that day was my 14th birthday. 
Not only, not only, not until weeks later that we were talking about birthdays did I bring it up. It's funny looking back now because I can tell you the exact day every one of these people were born and probably the hour too. As our freshman year continued, we created a bond that has been unbreakable. We created a family that was faithful, welcoming, and overall outgoing. When eighth graders came to shadow us, we treated them just like they were already part of the family. We wanted our family to grow and prosper, and that's exactly what it did. When the next year started, our sophomore year, the milestones continued to happen. We had a new baby in the family, new freshmen, almost doubling us in size. Our family was expanding. For a whole year, we had been spoiled all by ourselves, but all of a sudden, there was no longer room for us to do cartwheels in the hallway. And we had to get our agenda book signed when we needed to leave the classroom. Not only did new freshmen come, but something else happened. We were able to play sports. Soccer and basketball started to take off, as well as new clubs and activities for us to get involved in. Not a single team won a sporting event that year. We were always outnumbered on the bench, but one thing we didn't lack was team spirit and pride. I can remember the very first girls soccer game. It was a beautiful sunny day, only one cloud in the sky. All of a sudden, it got very dark and that one cloud started to spit hail at us. The wind blew in our faces and rain poured down, but we refused to get off the field. We tied that game against Mascuda, and it gave us confidence. We may not have won many games that year, any games that year, but we were the next. By junior year, our school was bursting at the seams. Our tiny hallways were no longer able to hold us. We needed a new building. Bishop Pat Rocky blessed the grounds and construction began, another milestone in the books. Each time I drove by, another wall was being put up. I remember one day when Mr. Scholes called us out to the office and told us to get our coats. We don't usually take field trips, and I would like to let everybody know that we don't go anywhere without getting one of those pesky commercial slips signed. I know all of the seniors can say that we probably signed a hundred of them. Um, so we were definitely a little bit confused. As the 17 of us were loaded up on the bus, we were told that we would get to watch the final wall being put up on the school. It might not seem like a big deal, but it symbolized for us that the building was really coming together. We would have a new building for our senior year and would be the, fir the first class to graduate from it. We were thrilled and somebody immediately asked when we could go inside. That wouldn't be for a few months, but that was okay because there was so much to do at the old building. Packing the building was chaotic. I remember people in the office always being on edge because half of their stuff was in storage and the other half was already in the new building. When the day came to start moving furniture to the new McGivney, a ton of people from the community came out to help. As I walked into the brand new school, my heart raced. It was so beautiful and everything smelled new. We had so many moving helpers that we were actually able to move in one day. I don't know how many homes can pack up and move in one day, let alone a school. Senior year in the new building was magical. It meant so much to the upperclassmen because we finally had our own space. Another milestone. We could finally have home games or sporting events in our own gym and have homecoming in our actual home. These are things I believe most schools take for granted, but not here at McGivney. It seems like years ago that we were scrambling to turn in college applications, working down to the last minute to finish scholarships, and scolding our parents to turn in the FAFSA, but it was less than nine months ago when it all started. Senior year has been quite the journey. I couldn't have done it without the help of my class. We will always be the first class, the inaugural class, the pioneers, but we cannot be seniors forever. Our time at McGivney is not infinite, but the memories we made here will last forever. We will take all that we have learned at McGivney and go out in the world to share it with others. No matter if that is in college, we're in a tiny home in Tennessee. It is our job now, and we have a new role, not as seniors, but as alumni. It is no longer our turn to be in charge of the school, but it is now our duty to keep the legacy of the school alive wherever we go. What an amazing journey it has been, and McGivney has come so far. 
It is not the shiny new building or the technology that makes McGivney great. It is the people that make it so incredible. Hello, everyone. Um, it's good to see so many of you guys here today. I would like to start with uh, by giving you guys just a little bit of background of what I experienced when I was first given this opportunity to speak. So it began with Mr. Scholes telling Brian, Mallon, and I that we were able to say a few words at graduation about anything we wanted to reflect on in our time here in the giving. A lot of things first came to my mind of what I wanted to say, but quickly realized that I just wouldn't have the time or the opportunity to say everything I wanted to say which then just left me stuck on what I actually wanted to mention in my speech. And then that made me procrastinate even more. And that shouldn't come to a shock, because if you guys know me personally, then you guys know I don't like writing <laughs> whatsoever. This is Dorgan, you know that firsthand. But once I actually sat down and started writing this, it became less daunting on my task. It became easier to do so, and I really enjoyed reminiscing on all the memories and moments that happen here in McGivney. So thank you, Mr. Scholes, for giving me one last assignment before I graduate. <laughs> so with that said, I would like to begin by first saying thank you to all that came out today to celebrate and to congratulate the 17 of us with our tremendous accomplishment and it's been a long time coming. You guys have been there for us every step of the way and have seen each and every one of us before me grow students, young adults, and children of Christ. I would also like to thank Bishop Rapaki for being with us through all of our milestones for our school. It is always an honor to have you here celebrating and giving us your blessing. Even though we are gathered here today to celebrate the first graduating class of Father McGivney, we, would also, we have always had a lot of attention put on us for that specific reason. But I would like to recognize all of the underclassmen and future Griffins that have been or will be a part of this school. A big reason as to why my class is here right now about to graduate is because of you and your family's decision for choosing McGivney. Even though it may have seemed to be a leap of faith to choose a school that's only been open for a short amount of time, all you guys still made the courageous decision to sign up, and each, and each year, the incoming freshman class size has only gotten bigger and bigger, which has been amazing to witness. Except for last year when we only had one and a half hallways at St. John Newman, and there was like 80 or so kids in the hallways trying to get to one of the six classrooms. That was kind of tough. You had to move everyone around trying to get to one class. But we've upgraded to two full long hallways on two separate levels. That's a big deal. So the amount of students in the hallways and crowdedness isn't too bad anymore for right now. But my class has created a lot of amazing friendships here that go beyond the people just in our senior class. We have been fortunate enough to get to know so many people of different ages and backgrounds from all different areas. And so many have really grown to become great friends of mine that I hope to keep for a long time. So thank you to the juniors, sophomores, freshmen, and future Griffins for giving this place a chance. However, it wouldn't even be possible for any of us to be here currently if it wasn't for Mr. and Mrs. Vilhard for envisioning a Catholic high school in this area and for working very hard and for many years to make their vision and dream come true. If it wasn't for their amazing idea right now, we wouldn't be able to be relieving all the wonderful moments and memories that we've had here in McGivney together. So from the bottom of our hearts, we all thank you. And so finally, on this long list of thanking people, uh, and before I start talking about my classmates and I, we can't forget the people that have had to actually deal with us day in and day out. Mr. Scholes, Ms. Madero, and the rest of the faculty and staff had to put up with our constant complaining and tons of sass, um, but you guys all have to admit, you love us either way. Even though some of you guys have a hard time admitting that. Mr. Johnson, Ms. Peary, I'm talking about you guys. <laughs> we'll get it out of you guys by the end of this. But nonetheless, the faculty and staff have always pushed us to work harder because they know what we are capable of and they recognize the potential we have in each and every one of us. Even when we just want to give up and throw a mini tantrum or just be mad at the world or just want to cry, for a little bit, I'm like, you know, Winston, who likes to cry constantly, but it's okay. We've gotten used to it, we have tissues on hand, it's okay. But um, we'd like to thank you for never letting us get sidetracked from our goals and our personal success. So for that constant reminder and push, and sometimes nagging, like every other day, we still greatly appreciate it and everything else you have done for us. 
So I guess it only leaves me to address one more group of people here today. And they just so happen to be sitting right in front of me. For 12 out of the 17 of us here, Paige, Logan, Brian, Hunter, Joey, Andy, Madeline, Danielle, Morgan, Hannah Winston, and myself, we have been here since the very beginning, which started with the inaugural mass and dinner, just like Madeline put it, it was very awkward. Because it was the day before our very first day of freshman year, and we didn't know each other whatsoever, not even a little bit. But, and we were also thrown together in a small, cramped little classroom, and we had to eat dinner with a bunch of complete strangers. And it was kind of intimidating, and personally made me a nervous wreck on the inside. But luckily over the years, we have created this very close bond between our class that has grown into one big McGivney family. And each year since our freshman year, we have been able to create a new branch of the family, and we are fortunate enough to see it grow bigger and bigger with each new incoming freshman class. However, I can't forget to mention those who have come in the later years to join us, to join the class of 2016. Nick, Griffin, Hannah Starnes, Erica, and Alana. All five of you guys have never been outsiders here. Quickly after each of your arrivals, you each have just jumped right on in and have become our new brothers and sisters in our very diverse and close-knit family that we've created. As a class, we have been through so many ups and downs. Throughout the course of our high, of our high school experience, we have always been there for one another, whether you want us to be there for you or not. You can't really escape us. But this year has always been the hardest for all of us to get through because we have been trying and are still trying to navigate our way of figuring out our plans for college and for essentially the rest of our future. However, we've been there, we've been there to comfort and support each other through everything, and we will continue to do that. There is not much left to say to you all, except that I love each and every one of you guys here. I don't want to trade these past four years here and give me for anything. So no matter where we go after this, and no matter where the future may take us, we will always be a Griffin, and this will always be our home. Thank you. I know that I speak on behalf of the entire Father McGivney family, offering our sincere gratitude to our Bishop, the Most Reverend Thomas John Paprocki, and the first commencement speaker. Thank you, Father Gettner. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Reverend fathers, faculty, staff, students, graduates, and their family and friends, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. It is good that we are here for this historic day as we celebrate the very first graduation ceremony for Father McGivney Catholic High School. The graduation of these seniors today is a testament to the faith and perseverance of so many individuals who have been a part of building what is quickly becoming a model Catholic institution here in our diocese. I commend you and I congratulate you. I am confident that the good work that has begun here will continue to bear fruit in the lives of these graduates and in the future of this high school. In 1994, a few years before all of you graduates were born, actor Tom Hanks starred in one of the most popular movies in recent decades, Forrest Gump. As I'm sure you know, the movie recounts various details from the extraordinary life of a man from Alabama, a life which included witnessing several defining moments of the latter half of the 20th century. As a long-distance runner myself, one of my favorite scenes from the movie is when Forrest recounts the time of his life during which he ran across the country multiple times. At first he was alone in his trek, but others would eventually join him. As he was telling the story, he said, for some reason what I was doing seemed to make sense to people. More and more people came to follow him obviously inspired 
by the example that he was setting. Somebody once told him that his running had given people hope. After more than three years of running, Forrest decided to stop and go home. The scene at the point in the movie shows him turning around in the middle of the desert and walking through a crowd of people who had been following him in his run. After a few moments of silence, a man from the crowd cried out in obvious frustration. Now what are we supposed to do? Many of them had dedicated all of their time and energy into following him, and it had all come to an abrupt end. In many ways, I believe this scene is a fitting one to describe what each of you graduates may be experiencing here at this stage in your life. Four years ago, you and your parents decided to follow something that may have initially seemed quite risky and uncertain. There was no telling whether the school would be successful or not. And there was no way of knowing what to expect during the journey ahead. Yet you set out on that journey, and you have no doubt seen some remarkable things happen. More and more students, no doubt encouraged by your faith in following this path, decided to join you. As you have moved into this brand new building at the beginning of this school year, I trust that you have truly found a home, seeing here one another as cherished gifts, as brothers and sisters in the Lord. As you gather today, I would not be surprised if you were to tell me that you had mixed feelings about this. The joys of this significant accomplishment is met with some sadness at this stage of your journey as it comes to an end. Graduating from high school brings with it, in many cases, some very significant changes. For all of you, it will mean leaving this comfortable setting which has become your home. All of you will be confronted with a new environment and a new structure in your life. Many of you will be moving away from home to pursue further education and college. This will bring it with it no shortage of new opportunities which will require adjustment. It is quite natural then for you to ask the same question. Now are we, what are we supposed to do? Instead of focusing on specific recommendations about what you should or should not do, I would like to offer some reflections on what to expect as you prepare for this next leg of your journey throughout life. While I cannot predict the specifics of the many experiences and challenges that each of you will face, I can give you some insights into what all of you will face in a general way. And knowing this will help to prepare you in choosing what to do as you move forward. I would like to propose as the basis for these insights some of the basic points from one of the meditations found in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. As a bit of background, St. Ignatius was the founder of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order to which our current Holy Father, Pope Francis, belonged. St. Ignatius had a desire to help people to develop their relationship with God. So he put together a series of prayers and topics for meditation that a person would follow in a long retreat format, usually for a period of roughly 30 days. The four weeks are broken up into themes which focus on various aspects of the spiritual life. During the second week, the meditations are intended to teach one how to follow Christ in our lives as his disciples. On the fourth day of that week, the retreatant is introduced to the meditation on the two standards. It is helpful to know that before he dedicated his life to following Christ, St. Ignatius was a soldier. So he would often use imagery related to that way of life in his meditations. Such was the case for the meditation on the two standards. The standard of which St. Ignatius speaks is the flag that would be held aloft during a medieval battle. The flag would be some sort of symbol recognized by the troops of a particular army. One could always look for that standard to know where to go 
if he were to get lost in the middle of the battle. Following the standard was a way of staying united and thus being more effective in the fight. The two standards presented in this meditation are that of Satan and of Christ. The retreatant is invited to call to their imagination the sight of the army of Satan. He would see the, pri the prince of darkness seated on a great throne of fire and smoke with a powerful army surrounding him, one that seemed indestructible. On his standard, one sees wealth, possessions, honor, and pride. Then the retreatant is invited to envision Christ on a lowly plain as he sits with meekness and humility under his standard. Those who surround him appear less powerful and less intimidating as they follow the standard marked by spiritual poverty, insults, and humility. The purpose of this meditation is to help us understand the value systems of Christ and Satan and to see which value system we are living. It is also a helpful meditation for all of you at this critical juncture in your life. While it may seem obvious that we should all be following the standard of Christ, for we believe that being on the side of Christ means the promise of victory, being able actually to know that we are following that standard is not always so clear. By this, I mean that the standard of Satan, also known as the standard of the world, can creep into our lives without our even being conscious of it. Thus, the need to understand the subtleties that exist in the way of the world. First of all, the standard of the world promises to make you happy. One of the most basic truths of our human nature is that we all have the desire to be happy. The philosopher Aristotle said that happiness is the one thing you can choose for itself. Everything else is chosen for the sake of happiness. The way of the world knows this truth all too well. It tells us that we can do whatever we, whatever we want, with whomever we want, and whenever we want. When our conscience offers some resistance to such ideas, we hear the world reassuring us, it's no big deal, don't worry about it. In reality, however, so many of the activities promoted by the way of the world while maybe bringing a temporary sense of pleasure, end up leaving us feeling empty. Then, in an effort to achieve that sense of pleasure again, we follow the same path, or choose from one of another of the enticing options on the menu, which promises that happiness. Left unchecked, the person can quickly fall into a state of addiction and is ironically reduced to being a slave of his or her own self-centered desires and passions. With the so-called newly achieved freedom that comes with going to college, young people are bombarded from every side with these invitations to find happiness. And without an awareness of this tactic of the world, combined with a strong faith, many succumb to the pressure and begin drifting away from the standard of Christ. It is not the desire of Christ that we should fall into the slavery of the world. In the Gospel of St. John, Jesus tells us, If you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truths of our Catholic faith protect us from falling into slavery so that we can experience the freedom and joy of being his beloved sons and daughters. The happiness promised by the Gospel is that of the Beatitudes, while on the surface they may not seem attractive, our faith assures us that they bring a deep and abiding happiness, one that will not be swept away like the pleasure that comes from the world. Therefore, when you are confronted with the things of the world that promise happiness, pray that the Lord will show you the truth and then trust that by following His way. You will find an even greater happiness then, for it will be the true happiness that He alone gives us. Another way in which the way of the world will try to entice you 
is through your intellect. By this I mean that the ways of the world are presented in a crafty way, making them sound logical and believable. These ideas will draw upon some elements that we as Catholics hold to be true. Take, for example, the rhetoric in the debate about abortion. The so-called pro-choice side of the argument claims compassion and love for the woman faced with an unexpected pregnancy. Respect for the dignity of all human life, including the mother, however, is at the heart of our rejection of abortion. Thus we have your school's motto, Servire Culture Vitae, to serve the culture of life. What supporters of abortion fail to mention is the undeniable truth that abortion destroys innocent human life and in just about every case leaves a deep emotional wound in the woman that she will carry for the rest of her life. Here our Catholic faith shows how the respect for the dignity of life includes the unborn child and the entire life of the woman, knowing the long-lasting effects that abortion can introduce into her life. Such is the case for so many of the arguments that support activities and ideas promoted by the standard of the world. On the surface, they seem harmless or even beneficial, but they fail to explore the deeper truths and consequences that underlie those activities and ideas. It is therefore important to approach these situations from the logic of our faith. You graduates have been blessed with an abundance of wisdom as you have grown in your understanding of your Catholic faith over these past four years. This great gift will be essential for you as you move forward to help you properly evaluate situations so as to avoid falling into the traps of the world. The famous British Catholic author G.K. Chesterton offers a helpful insight in this regard in an essay entitled, Why I am Catholic. He speaks of the Catholic Church in the following way. There is no other case of one continuous, intelligent institution that has been thinking about thinking for 2,000 years. Its experience naturally covers nearly all experiences, and especially nearly all errors. The result is a map in which all the blind alleys and bad roads are clearly marked. All the ways that have been shown to be worthless by the best of all evidence the evidence of those who have gone down them." End of quote. The standard of Christ, which always includes the Church that he founded, emerges victorious in every intellectual debate because what she professes and teaches is not mere opinion or the reflection of a majority position fashionable at the time. No, what the Church teaches is the truth. And that truth, once again, will free us from buying into the various errors which, on the surface, may appear convincing, but in reality are dangerous propositions which lead us into darkness. On a closely related point, the way of the world seeks to break us down by making us think that, the, that following the standard of Christ is a worthless waste of time. It encourages us to see the vast array of ideas and ways of living against which Christ and his church warn us and to feel overwhelmed. We may see that those who faithfully struggle to live the Catholic faith in its fullness are few and far between. When so many of our peers are buying into the ideas of the world, we may feel a sense of helplessness, wondering how we could ever remain faithful in the midst of so much pressure from the world around us. Once again, our Catholic faith comes to our rescue. In particular, we are encouraged by the many promises given to us by Jesus in the scriptures to help us overcome that fear of defeat. For example, after the Last Supper, just before he was to head off to his passion and death on the cross, Jesus tells his disciples, in the world you will have trouble, but take courage. I have conquered the world. He also encourages us to have great faith in the church to guide us through the rough waters of this world on our journey toward heaven. He tells these powerful words to St. Peter, our first Pope. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall never prevail against it. We also have the witness of so many saints 
who have held firm to the faith in the midst of the trials of this world and who are now enjoying eternal happiness in heaven. One such saint is St. Paul, whose many writings were meant to encourage the early church not to falter in the faith that they had received. Those words are timeless as they continue to speak to us today. For example, we recall what he said to the church in Corinth regarding the struggle that they were to face. He reminded them that God is faithful and will not let you be tried beyond your strength. But with the trial, he will also provide a way out so that you may be able to bear it. When we feel overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the standard of the world, we would do well to return to those promises of Christ in order to be reassured that everything is possible for the one who has faith. We can also look to the crucifix as the model for how the standard of Christ emerges victorious. When all seemed lost and defeat seemed certain, Jesus, who had submitted himself to death, rose in glory on Easter Sunday. Looking to the symbol of the crucifix reminds us that darkness and death have been destroyed. For as St. John reminds us, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Nor will the darkness of the world ever overcome the light of Christ. While I said that I was not going to tell you what to do at this stage of your journey, let me suggest just one piece of advice. Choose each and every day to follow the standard of Christ. It will mean that you may be in the minority. It will mean that you may be mocked, insulted, or ridiculed for your choice to stick with your Catholic faith. It will mean that while others strive to gain more possessions and earn more wealth, you may, be ha you may have to be content with less. It will mean that while others seek to draw attention to themselves and their many accomplishments, you will be content to redirect attention away from yourself and toward others and toward God. In sum, following the standard of Christ will mean many things which may seem to be unattractive, but our Catholic faith reminds us that following that standard is the only way that will guarantee that we will become who God has created us to be, saints, who enjoy eternal happiness in the glory of heaven. I pray that you graduates will choose to follow this standard from this day forward. You do not do it alone, for Christ has given you a share in the very life of the church through the gift of your baptism and the other sacraments. The gifts of the Holy Spirit will enable you to do what you yourself are unable to do, namely to resist the ways of the world which are always attempting to draw you away from the path of truth. By living close to Christ and his church, you will experience the freedom, the happiness, and the peace which your heart desires. Jesus wants you to experience this abundance of life. So stay close to him and let him fight for you and bring you into a share in the victory that he has already won for you. In conclusion, I would like to draw upon another movie. It comes from the film version of William Shakespeare's play, Henry V. There's a powerful scene preceding the Battle of Agincourt on St. Crispin's Day, October 25th, 1415. The English are outnumbered by the French, five to one. When King Henry overhears someone wish that some of the unemployed men back in England could have been with them to help them in battle. The king delivers his impassioned address to his troops in what is known as the St. Crispin's Day speech, which I share with you. The fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when the day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall never go by. From this day to the ending of the world, be we in it, shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition, 
and gentlemen in England shall now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap, cheap while any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. As we all know, roused and inspired by Henry's oratory, the king and his band of brothers go on to victory despite the overwhelming odds. After the Battle of Agincourt, when it was apparent that the English had been victorious, Henry V proclaimed, Come, go we in procession to the village, but with this acknowledgement that God fought for us, do we all holy rites, let there be sung non nobis and te deum. The king was referring to the Latin hymn of praise to God called the te deum and to the opening words of Psalm 115, non nobis domine, non nobis, sed nomini tuo da gloria, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. King Henry V represents someone who truly followed the standard of Christ, one who was confident in the victory of the Lord despite overwhelming odds. He recognized that the achievement was not his own based on what he himself had accomplished. It was God who fought for him, and it is God who will fight for us. We do not account any of our accomplishments to our efforts alone, but to him who has given us everything we have. May our lives be lived to give glory always to him, not to ourselves, and we shall one day rest in his glory for all eternity. No, no, be domine, domine. No, no, be domine. Sed nomine, sed nomine, to o da gloria. Non nobis domine, domine, non nobis domine. Sed nomine, sed nomine, to o da gloria. Non nobis domine, domine, non nobis domine. Sed nomine, sed nomine, tu o da gloria. May God give us this grace. Amen. Please hold all applause until all of our students have received their diplomas. Paige Elizabeth Anderson. Logan Matthew Brown. Nicholas Turry Danny Carlson. Brian Thomas Domrick. Erica Mackenzie Donaldson. Alana Marie Giacoletto. Hunter Joseph Cleet. Abram Munoz.
Joseph Anthony Richard. Nina Isabel Rodriguez. Griffin Kazmar Skubish. Anna Gabrielle Starnes. Andrew Michael Taphorn. Madeline Margaret Teal. Danielle Rose Vilhard. Morgan Elizabeth Wagner. Hannah Rose Winston. Please join me in congratulating our graduates. They have over $2.475 million in scholarship offers. That figures out to about $140,000 per student. They have over 2,800 hours of community service, not counting the extra service that they put into their parishes. They have an average ACT composite of 24. The state average is around 20, 21. 24% of the students received a composite score of over 30 on their ACT. They received, and I did this the other day, they received 518 A's on their report cards over four years. Just a pretty impressive number, guys. They have three presidential scholarship interviews and one student was selected to interview with MIT. We had one student who was selected as a freshman, never been done before, on the Summer Institute at Missouri. We had two News Democrat Students of the Week. One student was selected for a summer internship in Washington, D.C. We have a medical scholar at St. Louis University, three Illinois State Scholars, which ranks them in the top 5% nationally. 12 of the 17 seniors are graduating with honors. Five of those 12 students have high honors. The average GPA for the senior class is 3.295. Pretty impressive. Teachers, what a phenomenal job you've done. And, and to the seniors, you've truly paved the way for all those who attend Father McGibney in the future. May God bless you. I have yet another first. It's an award given on behalf of the president of Father McGivney Catholic High School, the Magna Caritas President's Award. It is presented to an individual who has demonstrated a great love, Magna Caritas, for Catholic education and a great love for promoting the mission of Father McGivney High School through prayer, encouragement, and selfless service. 
The recipient of this first award has served as our diocesan superintendent of schools. She will retire. She makes that known to everybody in June. She is a member of both the Father McGivney Board of Directors and the Founders Board. Today, I would like to present the first Father McGivney Catholic High School President's Magna Caritas Award to Mrs. Jean Johnson. At this time, I would like to uh, ask our partner pastors who represent our parishes, and I want to thank them for their prayer and their generosity. Without your support, none of these firsts of Father McGivney Catholic High School would have happened. Finally, I'd like to invite these pastors to please join myself and Bishop Paparaki, sending forth our graduating class with this Irish blessing sung by our school boys. If the students, our seniors, and please, our graduates, would please stand. God, we praise you and we thank you for the graces and blessings that you have showered upon all of us. We thank you for the graces that have made possible the Father McGivney Catholic High School. We thank you for the graces and blessings that have brought our graduating class of 2016, our first graduating class from Father McGivney Catholic High School to this point. We ask you to Send your blessings with them as we send our graduates on their way. Be always with them and guide them in all they think and say and do. Bless our benefactors, our board, our faculty, our staff, our parents, and all those who are involved in the life of this institution. May Almighty God be with you and may he bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Nice for ready. It is my pleasure to introduce you to the inaugural class of 216 graduates. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Faculty. 